section, we will be discussing the introduction to design workflow. There are four main steps for the design design, and most of the brainstorming will occur during this process. Next, we have the basic solution. Then we will optimize this basic solution best fit for our system. And finally, we will consider tolerance and manufacturability. So for the first phase, the idea phase, this is where we will answer some questions such as what is the purpose of this system? What type of system is needed to achieve this goal? So is it an imaging, an illumination, or a laser system? And finally, what specifications are required? Once we've answered those critical questions, it's time to come up with a basic solution. Once the goals are identified and specifications for the optical system are set, we could create a basic design solution which is going to serve as an initial draft and this solution should be very minimal and designed only to achieve the general functionality without focusing on manufacturing tolerances or performances just yet. There are three different solution types for your basic solution and we will go through each one of them. So the first one is a finite finite conjugate this means that light comes from a definitive source, and as it exits the system, it focuses to a single spot. For the infinite infinite conjugate, light is, comes in from infinity as a collimated beam. The diameter is adjusted through the system, and finally the exiting beam has a new diameter but is still collimated. Then finally, for the third solution type, infinite finite conjugate, a collimated light is focused to a single spot. So as we can see, the parallel lights coming in from infinity closing into a definitive end point. In order to help you possibly categorize what your application type might need for a solution, here are some common applications for the three different solution forms. So for finite finite conjugate, we have electronics inspection, relay systems, and machine vision. For infinite infinite, we have telescopes or beam expanders, and finally, for infinite finite conjugates, autocollimators, infinity corrective objectives, and imaging projection. Of course, just having those application examples alone may not help you in identifying which solution type you need if your application is different than those examples. So to help you with that, we will discuss the paroxial solution. The paroxial solution are simple solutions under ideal perfect lens conditions in which the calculations do not regard aberrations caused by lens thickness, radius of curvature, dispersion, or glass type, and it assumes small angle measurements. And if you are unfamiliar, aberration is the spreading out of light over some region of space rather than being focused to a point. So a good example of this is if all the rays are not focused to a precise point but instead are kind of scattered around this point, you may see a blurry vision. The paroxial solution will help in determining which of the three solution forms will be needed for your system's application. A fundamental component of solving for the paroxial solution is called ray tracing. And ray tracing is the act of mechanically tracing a ray through an optical system while calculating angles of refraction and reflection at each surface. This is the primary method to determine a system's optical performance. While we won't go into many details on ray tracing or finding the paroxial solutions, you can learn more about these two things through the Optics Academy course number two called Optics Review. We will, however, discuss some general rules of thumb for ray tracing. So there are three, the first one being highlighted in the purple. So the first rule is that rays entering the lens parallel to the axis will pass through the second focal point. 
So we can see that happening here with our purple ray. It is traveling towards the lens parallel to the axis and bending out of the lens in a way such that it passes through the second focal point. For rule number two in the yellow, rays passing through the center of the lens will not be refracted and will continue to travel a straight path. So any ray passing through the center of the lens is not going to bend throughout its path and will travel straight through. And then finally for rule number three in green, rays which pass through the first focal point prior to entering the lens will exit the lens parallel to the axis. So rule number three is kind of like the inverse of rule number one. So instead of entering the lens parallel to the axis, it will exit the lens parallel to the axis. And instead of exiting the lens passing through the second focal point, it will enter the lens passing through the first focal point. And it's also important to note that these three rules are also true and applicable for both convex and concave lenses. Here are just a few variables for the paraxial solutions and their definitions. You can feel free to read through these. However, these are all labeled on the previous slide, which you can refer back to if need be. Now that we've come up with our basic design solution, we can optimize this to better fit your application. Optimization is necessary to improve your initial basic design solution. Now that you've come up with a basic design solution for your application, it is time to optimize. Optimization is necessary to improve your initial basic design solution, and it will help your system near its key specifications. Luckily, Optic Studio offers a few tools to make optimization easy. To explore a few of these tools offered by Optic Studio, you may open a sample project following the steps highlighted in yellow. However, you will be walked through a full sample project at the end of the course, so if you would not like to do this right now, that is okay. The first tool offered by Optic Studio is the Optimize tool, and this can be reached on a keyboard shortcut with Control shift o This is an automatic local optimization, which allows you to select algorithm type, number of cycles, and number of cores. Again, we won't go into the technicalities of each of these functions in this section, as those will be covered later on in the course but the purpose of this video is to introduce you to the options that you are provided with. Next, we have the Merit Function Editor, or the button F6 on your keyboard. This will allow you to define, modify, and review the system Merit Function. The Merit Function is a function which measures how well the actual data fits the desired results. So smaller merit functions mean better agreement between actual data and desired data. Every surface can be toggled between variable and non-variable, and setting a surface to be a variable allows the software to automatically adjust these values to best fit when optimizing. Finally, in the design workflow process, we have tolerance and manufacturability. Tolerance is permissible limits of variation in physical dimensions, properties, or other significant measurements to the product or system. In simpler terms, tolerance is just an allowable error, and there will be more on this in Section 6. Manufacturability is how manufacturable a product is considering factors such as tolerance, cost, rate, and quality. Down below, there's an image of the manufacturing triangle, and this shows you the three key components of manufacturability. When one changes, the other two will also adjust accordingly. So the three main components are scheduling, or timing of production, cost, how much will it cost to make this product, and quality, how good does the quality of this product need to be for its given application. The best design solution will usually fall somewhere in between, so a good balance of low tolerances and high manufacturability is ideal.
An in-depth detail on tolerancing and calculating these tolerances can be found in the courses 7 through 10 in Optics Academy. Design for Manufacturability, or DFM, is a general engineering process of designing products early on to optimize the components of the manufacturing triangle, so lowering costs, improving quality, and reducing time to market. There are five different parts to the DFM. We have process, design, material, environment, and finally testing and compliance. So in the DFM, the process is, what is the best method of manufacturing for this product, and which manufacturing process will deliver the required quality of the product at a reasonable cost? So this is where we think about how we want our product to be made. Next, we have material. So material properties to consider are thermal, optical, flammability, electrical, mechanical, and aesthetic. And then finally, for the third part, we have design. This is where we consider design of physical components, which must be realistic and producible. And geometry and other considerations are critical here. Next in the DFM, we have environmental considerations. So some questions to answer are, where is this product intended to be used? and what environments could this product possibly be put to off nominal use. So if we think about any optical system, the system will not be designed nor built the same way if the intended location is in outer space versus if the intended location of use lays on Earth. And then finally, testing and compliance. Products must comply with company, third party, or other safety standards, so it's a good practice to continuously check your system against these standards to make sure that they comply.